I'm going to be reading this scripture reading from Judges 5, from the Christian Standard Bible, Deborah's Song. On that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang. When the leaders lead in Israel, when the people volunteer, blessed be the Lord. Listen, kings, pay attention, princes. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you came from Sai, when you marched from the fields of Ed Edom, the earth trembled, the skies poured rain, the clouds poured water, the mountains melted before the Lord. Then even Sina, Sina, before the Lord, God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, son of Enath, in the days of Jahil, the main roads were deserted because travelers kept to the side of a road. Villages were deserted. They were deserted in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, a mother in Israel. Israel chose new gods. Then there was war in the city gates. Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. My heart is with the leaders of Israel, with the volunteers of the people. Blessed be the Lord. You who ride on white donkeys, who sit on saddle blankets, and who travel on the road, give praise. Let them tell the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous deeds of his villages in Israel, with the voices of the singers at the water places, at the watering places. Then the Lord's people went down to the city gates. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, sing a song. Arise, Barak and take your prisoners, son of Abinoam. Then the saviors, then the survivors came down to the nobles. The Lord's people came down to me against the, war the warriors. Those with the roots in Amalek came from Ephraim. Benjamin came with your people after you. The leaders came down from Mikai, and those who carry a martial staff came from Zebulun. Then princes, of Issachar were with Deborah. Issachar was with Barak. They were under his leadership in the valley. There was a great searching of heart among the clans of Reuben. Why did you sit among the sheep pens, listening to the playing of pipes for the flocks? There was great searching of heart among the clans of Reuben. Gilead, Gilead remained beyond the Jordan. Dan, why did you linger at the ships? Um, Asher remained at the seashores and stayed in his harbors. The people of Zebulun defied death, Naphtali also, on the heights of the battlefield. Kings came and fought, then the kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. But they did not plunder the silver. The stars fought from the heavens. The stars fought with Caesarea from the paths. The river, Kish, the river Kishon swept them away. The ancient river, the river Kishon, march on, my soul in strength. The horse's hooves then hammered, the galloping, galloping of his stallions. Curse, Meraz, says the angels of the Lord. Bitterly curse his inhabitants, for they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord with the warriors. Most blessed of women in Jahil, the wife of Heber, the Canaanite. She is most blessed among tent. She is most blessed among tent women dwelling. He asked for water. She gave him milk. She brought him cream in a majestic bowl. She reached for a tent peg, her right hand for a work, workman's hammer. Then she hammered Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. He collapsed, he fell, he lay down between her feet. He collapsed, he fell between her feet. Where he collapsed, there he fell, dead. Caesarea's mother looked through the window. She peered through the lattice, crying out, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why don't I hear the hoofbeats of his horses? Her wisest princesses answer her. She even answered herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil? A girl or two for each warrior, the spoil of colored garments for Caesarea, the spoil of an embroidered garment or two for my neck. Lord, may all your enemies perish as Caesarea did. 
but may those who love him be like but may those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its strength and the land had peace for 40 years thank you thank you so much um, good morning everyone how you guys doing very good very very good uh, on this very cold. Uh, it's been a cold week. Um, I think it's slightly better this morning, um, but this week has been cold, and I have found it to be somewhat strange uh, to get rain in winter. Um, these are Cape Town things, and so if you're from Cape Town and uh, you have brought that with you, uh, could I ask that you take that back, um, please? <laughs> and then shout out to, uh, to Katler. Um This man came prepared. Uh, so... If, 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 I don't know if you can, from where you're seated, uh, take a look. So your right, my left. Um, he did not come to play. I'm, I'm encouraged. I mean, because you could have easily gone, I'm going to stay in bed like this. this. Like, I'm not. But you're like, no, you know what? Let me just bring my bed uh, to the gathering. Um, so it's absolutely incredible. And you're also giving permission. Because I know many of you have thought, you know, can I, can I bring my blanket? Ah, but it might be too much. I don't know. Hey, yes, you can, all right? Yes, yes, you can. Um, and then shout out to our, our production team. Um, I mean, like, yeah, as my, as my five-year-old likes to say, we should give them a round of a clap, um, which, you've already, which you've already done. Um, but really, shout out to, to the team, uh, to Christian, Celiers, uh, KG, uh, ladies at the back, Jess, uh, BB. I mean, just to be able to hook us up to a generator to make sure all the plugs go in the right places. To Like, it's chaotic, um, but there's a level of, of peace and calmness that they do it with um, that just encourages me uh, and reminds me that God is still in control. Um, and so thank you uh, for what you guys do and how you do it. Um, and then I know, uh, well, we hope, we hope that the power will come on um, around 10. That is the promised schedule um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into the text because we have a, a lot to get through in a little uh, amount of time, um, but there may be a transition time where I'll just stop talking or I'll, uh, they'll make a sign and they'll uh, re-plug things and get the power back on and then hopefully uh, you'll be able to see on the screen as well because um, we're, we're going to be in, in Judges chapter 5, but I, I need to walk you through Judges chapter 4 uh, because it gives context to uh, what's going on here uh, in this particular story, all right? And so uh, before we jump in, I'm going to pray, pray for you, ask that you pray for me, uh, that God would do that which only He can do, and that is save many. Um, and so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us. Um, we're thankful that we uh, don't trust in man-made things. We are thankful for them because they are from your hand, um, but ultimately, Lord, we want to trust in you. Um, and so we, we ask that, God, you would uh, engage every single heart that is here this morning. Um, open up our eyes uh, to your word. Um, speak to us. Uh, meet us where we are. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We need you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Judges chapter 4, verse 1. The Israelites again, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud had died. So the Lord sold, that's important, don't miss that. The Lord sold them to King Jamin of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar. The commander of his army was Sisera. Now, this is important because Sisera was the, the secret to King Jabin's kind of reign, right? It was because of his dominance that they were taking over. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harriseth of the nations. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord because Jabin had 900 iron chariots, and he harshly oppressed them 20 years. Deborah, a prophetess and the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to settle disputes. Now, let me say this real quick. 
a lot of people have, I believe, misinterpreted this piece of Scripture here. Because I've, I've heard it said that uh, Deborah, being a woman, was, was raised up to be a judge only because of the failure of men. Now, now that's incorrect. And the reason that I say that it's incorrect is because we see Deborah judging long before any mention of the failure of men. That, 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 that women could be and were judges. Now, what is a judge? I'm glad you asked. A, a, a judge is, is like a, a military warrior and a, a judge, much like we understand a judge today. It's someone who would settle disputes between uh, different parties. And women could be judges. This tells us that God gives to women the same spiritual gifts that he gives to men. Let me say this again. God gives to women the same spiritual gifts he gives to men. Whether it's prophecy or healing or serving or leading, whatever the gift God gives to men and to women. And it's Him who gives. Right? There's so many people out here that have self-appointed gifts. Be very careful of that. It's God who gives, and he, he gives generously, and He gives graciously, and He gives to both men and women. What does that mean for us? Well, it means here at Rooted Fellowship, women, we want to, to see those gifts on display. We want to come alongside you and bring to the surface that which God has placed in you. But but for that to happen, you've got to be in community. Why? Because the gifts were given to the glory of God and to the flourishing of His community. A a gift serves no purpose in isolation. No purpose. And so you've got to be in community. So many people go... I wonder what my gift is. Get plugged into community and we'll figure that out. There is an affirming of that gift in the context of community. And it also gives us the opportunity to go, hey, you know that, that, that gift you thought you had? That's a private gift, not a public gift, right? Like when I sing, that's a private gift for me in the comfort of my own home, right? And, and here when no one can hear me except the Lord I will exercise that gift to his glory. But but that only happens in the context of community, not in isolation. You see, when you're in isolation, that's when you appoint the gift to yourself, by yourself. And we don't want that. God gives. He gives. He gives graciously and generously. Now, having said all of this, right, having said all of this, It's important for me to also say that gifts are different to roles and responsibilities. Gifts are different to roles and responsibilities. And as we come to the scriptures, we will see that God often assigns certain roles and responsibilities to men and then certain roles and responsibilities to women. Now, now, in case someone goes, oh, no, well, hold on, hold on. Let, let me repeat what I said a few moments ago. God gives the same gifts to men and to women. But, but there is a difference between gifts and roles and responsibilities. And oftentimes God will go, you know what, I'm going to assign certain roles and responsibilities to men and certain roles and responsibilities to women. Now, I... I wish, I wish I had more time to unpack what that means and and how that works itself out in the context of the church. Uh, I don't have time, and that's also not the purpose of the text. But for those of you who are going, hmm, that makes me feel a little uncomfortable, I am more than happy to have the conversation with you. In fact, I would love to. I would absolutely love to. We'll go to Scripture. We'll unpack it. What does this mean? Where has the church failed? And, and, And where do we need to do better? I'd love to have that conversation. In fact, let's do it over a meal, um, and I will gladly uh, take your contribution to that meal in the form of payment. <laughs> but no kidding, abs- I, would, I would love to have that conversation. Because, I, look, there are difficult texts in the Bible, and I don't think we should shy away from them. 
We, we should run to them and go, God, what does this mean for us? Help us understand what it is that you are saying because it reveals who you are and it allows us to flourish as a community. And, and it's okay. And it's okay to, to go, man, this just doesn't feel right. I get that. You, you know how many passages of Scripture I read and I go, it just, it just doesn't feel right. Like, I don't like this because it just doesn't make me feel good. That's okay, man. Feelings are okay. They have been given to us by God. But, but here's the thing. They help us navigate through life. They are horrible saviors. And so while you come to the Scripture and you read something that just doesn't make you feel right, you go, okay, God, I need to submit my feelings to you. Help me understand what this means. You know one I don't like? Love your enemies. I'm just not feeling that one. Especially on the days where I feel like my enemies are right in front of me, constantly poking at me. Oh my God, like, does it really, like, okay, what, but what does the Greek say? Let me try to, okay, 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 I see the Greek. Maybe, God, let me read it in the context of, okay, you know what? It, it, it still says, love your enemies. And so I've got to submit my feelings to the word of God. Because he knows how I am supposed to operate, how I was designed to live for his glory and to find ultimate joy. And so I'm, 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 I'm all good. Come with your feelings. But my hope is that you'd also come with, hey, here's what I see in the word of God. And let's wrestle. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. I'll go, hey, guys, I was wrong. I missed it. I missed it. I apologize. Let's, let's do better. Because that's what it means to be in community. All right? But here in the text, we can clearly see that God gifts, the same gifts that he gives to men, he gives to women and then to women to men. And that is why Deborah can be a, a judge. She's also a prophetess, and we'll see that gift on display in verse 6. But, but, but again, before I go, I, I want to say this. This is important. Ladies, God has a calling on your life. Now, I know that there's been a lot said in other different churches or social media, whatever. Like God has a calling on your life. You are made in his image with purpose. And there's nothing more beautiful than, than, than seeing, not just women, but seeing people exercise the gift that God has placed over them and living out the calling that he has given them. Nothing more, it's absolutely beautiful. And so I, I want you to hear that. Uh, the other thing I want you to hear is that because God has a calling on your life, you have spiritual authority. Amen. Did, 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 you, did you hear me? You, you have spiritual authority. Now you've got to figure out, okay, where, where can I exercise that, Lord? In what context? And how do I do it in humility? But you have spiritual authority. And there are some ridiculous churches out there that go, you know what? No, 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 a woman's place is only in the kitchen or in the home. No, that is foolishness. That's, that's laziness on the part of the theologian who's unpacking that. And let me go and take it a little bit further. If you're a Christian, you're a theologian. You're a theologian. You're one who, who wants to understand who God is. I study the Bible so that I can understand, God, who you are and how you've called me to live. You're a theologian. Don't be lazy. There are way too many lazy theologians out there. God is a calling on your life. And you have spiritual authority. You are a leader. Verse 6. This is Deborah. She summoned Barak, and, and Barak means lightning, all right? You're probably wondering on your way telling us that. I thought it was pretty cool, uh, but it'll make sense in a moment here as well. She summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali and said to him, hasn't the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Go, deploy the troops on Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men from the Naphtalites and Zebulonites. Then I, this is God, I will lure Caesarea, commander of Jabin's army, his chariots and his infantry at the Wadi Kishon, that's the valley, to fight against you. And I, this is God still speaking, I will hand them over, hand him over to you. This is Deborah's prophetic gift coming out on display here because she goes to Barak and says, hey, 
God said, I must come speak to you, did he not already say to you that you should go do this? Which means that Barak had heard from God, but was being disobedient. Do you see that? Even though his name is, is it means lightning, he, he did not operate at lightning speed when God spoke to him. And so she comes and she says, didn't, didn't God speak to you? Didn't he say, go do this? How, how many Baraks in the house today? What has God said to you? And you might be sitting and going, but I haven't audibly heard from him yet. Where would you like us to go? He, he calls us to serve. God's spoken to us. Go serve. Go give. Go love. Go make disciples. What's, what's going on? Do, do you need someone to come with the spirit of Deborah to come and tell you? Happens every week. Should happen every day. Verse 8, Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. I will gladly go with you, Deborah responds, but you will receive no honor on the road you're about to take because the Lord will sell Sisera to a woman. This is both a warning and a rebuke. It's a warning and a rebuke. And most people tend to think that this woman that Deborah is speaking about is herself. But it's not. She's not speaking of herself. We're in for a surprise. So Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. Verse 10, Barak summoned Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. 10,000 men followed him and Deborah also went with him. Now, Heber, the Kenite, had moved away from the Israelites, or had moved away from the Kenites, the son of Hobab, Moses' father-in-law, and pitched his tent beside the oak tree of Zananim, which was near Kadesh. This seems super random, right? So that we're, we're listening to the story of Deborah and Barak as he's getting the men that he needs to go and fight this war, and then randomly we get verse 11, we hear about this individual called Heber, the Kenite, and it's like, what's this got to do with the story? This, this feels and seems random, but because it's the word of God, nothing is random, all right? Nothing is random. And so let's ask the question, who, who, who is Heber? Who are, the, who are the Kenites? What's going on here? Well, Heber had a wife. Her name was Jael. But we'll get to that in a moment. Heber was a Kenite, as the text tells us. And they were distant descendants of Israel. How, you might ask? Well, through Jethro. Right? Jethro, the priest of Midian. Right? So Jethro was a Midianite who happened to be, as the text also tells us, Moses' father-in-law. Friends, I hope you're making the connection here. All right? I hope you're making the connection here. Moses' father-in-law, who also carried the family name Ruel. Now, what does Ruel mean? I'm glad you asked. You guys are asking great questions this morning. Uh, Ruel means friend of God. Oh, no, why are you telling us this? Just hold on. But here in the text, we're told that he was the, the, the son of Hobab. Well, what does Hobab mean? It means beloved. All right? So, so you've got Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, whose family name is Ruel, friend of God, but is a son of Hobab, beloved. We know that this is Jethro and that this is his name. Because we see it here in Judges chapter 4, verse 11, but it also comes up in Numbers chapter 10, verse 29. And that passage is describing Jethro. So it's affirming all of this. Jethro was a descendant of Abraham. Now, some of you might not know this. See, in Genesis chapter 25, after Sarah died, we're told that Abraham married one of his concubines. Concubine? We don't have time to get into that. Okay, no one's perfect. 
But he, he marries one of his concubines. Her name is Keturah. Genesis chapter 25. And, and then together they have six sons. They probably had more kids, more daughters, but you know, the Bible doesn't always mention the daughters. But they were told that, that together they had six sons. And one of them was Midian. If we continue to connect the dots, when we get to Jethro, the Midianite, well, it's because he comes from Midian. Through Exodus, you would remember that I made the connection through the scriptures uh, that Keturah was most probably an African, right? Which means that uh, Jethro had some African in, in him. We see that to be true because of the way that Zipporah, Jethro's daughter, is described, right? When Miriam, Moses' sister, kind of has some uncomfortable words with Moses about his choice of wife because she is from Africa. I say this because I, I hear it so many times when people go, um, isn't Christianity a white man's religion or isn't it a Western religion? Uh, no, don't be a lazy theologian. I'll probably say it with a little bit more compassion. Um, but, but no, like, like the, the, the narrative of Africa has, has been in the Christian narrative for a very long time. For a very long time. In fact, if we look at the Bible and we study it, and then we kind of look at history, which usually kind of points back to the scriptures, we will clearly see that Christianity went south long before it went north. And if we want to play this game of like, well, you know, is it a white man's religion? Is it a Western religion? Technically, it's a Middle Eastern religion. All right? But no one ever says that. That one was for free. The Kenites had a friendly, not perfect, but a friendly relationship with the Israelites. And I believe this goes all the way back to Abraham and Keturah. We know this to be true because during King Saul's reign, God instructed Israel to destroy the Amalekites. But mercy was shown to the Kenites who lived among the Amalekites. Before Saul attacked, he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you along with them, for you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. And so there's always been this kind of favor that they've experienced. And again, I believe it goes back to Genesis 25. And so here they are again. Here's Heber and his wife, Jael. They've moved away from the Kenites, right? Um, and we'll talk about why in a moment, but that's how they fit into the story. Verse 12, it was reported to Sisera that Barak, son of Abinom, had gone up Mount Tabor. Sisera summoned all of his 900 chariots and all the troops who were with him from Harasith of the nations to the Wadi Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has handed Sisera over to you. Hasn't the Lord gone before you? So Barak came down from Mount Tabor, and then 10,000 men following him. It's only when Deborah speaks these words to Barak that he begins to live out of his name, and so with lightning speed, he takes the troops with him. The Lord threw Sisera, all his charioteers, and all his army into a panic before Barak's assault. Sisera left his chariot and fled on foot. All right, so now we see this hot pursuit He's on foot and he's making a run for it. Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Harasith of the nations. And the whole army of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a single man was left. Meanwhile, Sisera had fled on foot to the tent of Jael. This is Heber's wife. Because there was, a, there was peace between King Jabin of Hazor and the family of Heber the Kenite. And so for some strange reason, Heber decided to get into some kind of agreement with the king. And so there's uh, peace. And so, so some commentators believe that, that Sisera being aware of this while on the run goes, maybe I can find a kind of safety at Heber's house. Jael went out to greet Sisera and said to him, come in, my lord. Come in with me. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent and she covered him with a blanket. So kind. He said to her, please give me a little water to drink for I am thirsty. 
She opened a container of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him again. I mean, this, this is priceless. So here's this commander, I mean, like dominance. But he's, he's exhausted because he's been running on foot. He's been on the run. Finds Jael at the tent. I don't know where Hebrew was. He probably wasn't there. The text doesn't tell us. And so she welcomes him in. He's like, oh, it's a place of safety. Oh, and it's a woman. Okay, great. So I don't have to like, be on guard, take out my sword. It's all good. Can I please get a drink? You know what? I'll do one better. Let me get you a glass of milk <laughs> and a blanket. Then, she said, then he said to her, stand at the entrance to the tent. If a man comes and asks you, is there a man here? Say no. While he was sleeping from exhaustion, Heber's wife, Jael, took a tent peg, grabbed a hammer, and went silently to Sisera. She hammered the peg into his temple and drove it into the ground, and he died. Now, I'm no doctor, but I'm pretty sure they didn't need to add that last part. <laughs> like, if anything is going to get hammered through my head and it comes out, like, into the ground, I'm, I'm probably dead. When Barak arrived in pursuit of Sisera, Jael went out to greet him and said to him, Come, I will show you the man you are looking for. Now, how proud must you have been? <laughs> huh? Hey, big strong warrior, come, let me show you the man that you're looking for. Come, no, 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 come. Would you also like some milk? Barak's probably going, no, nah, I'm good. I'm, I'm good on the milk. I'm good on the milk. Come and I'll show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there was Sisera lying dead with a tent peg through his temple. That day God subdued King Jabin of Canaan before the Israelites. The power of the Israelites continued to increase against King Jabin of Canaan until they destroyed him. That's the end of the story. End of the story. And so in chapter 5, Deborah writes a poem. We're told that it was sung by Deborah and Barak, but I believe that it's Deborah who wrote this poem. And and this, this poem is the telling of the story. And it's this, in this poem where we will find our teaching this morning. They are singing. We find them singing. See, singing is a, a natural and proper response to deliverance. It is a natural and proper response to deliverance. This, this is why I, I, I make a, a big deal of us singing. That this isn't Christian karaoke. You can do that at home. That if we show up together as the people of God, we sing. We sing because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross for us. It's a natural and proper response. We see this in Exodus 15. After the Israelites leave Egypt, they sing a song. We see this in Isaiah 26. Again, the Israelites coming out of Babylon, they sing a song. Revelation chapter 5. This is all of God's children, because we have defeated in Christ sin, death, and Satan. And so we sing. It is a proper and natural response to deliverance. And so here we find Deborah's song. It's very poetic. If you read it in the Hebrew, very, very poetic, which makes me super uncomfortable in trying to understand what it is that God is saying to us in his word. Because poetry is difficult. And I believe we've made it very difficult. Like, if you're a teacher in the house, you're making it difficult. (laughs) I remember as a young boy, I was 12 years old. It was my last year of primary school. And so our English teacher was preparing us for high school. Uh, we hadn't done poetry, we hadn't done literature at, uh, till that point, and so he's like, well, you're going to do this in high school, and so uh, it's, it's important for me to prepare you. And so he pulls out a small little poetry book, opens up the book, and then s- reads about maybe four or five, I believe they call them stanzas. Closes the book, and he says to us, okay, so what do you think that means? And before the kids who sit in front, who have their sandwiches kind of cut, where the crust is cut, uh, you, know, you know who I'm talking about, before they could answer the question, he throws that book out the window. And then he says, it doesn't matter what you think. 
He didn't, he didn't, say, he didn't say it like that. He, didn't, he definitely didn't say it like, like that. That's a little bit of the rock. I think the rock says that. But he did say it doesn't matter what you think. B- because what, what we should be asking is what did the poet mean when he wrote those words? But, but what we do today is we go, so what do you, what do you think? Well, I mean, I'd love to hear what you think, but is there a way to, to figure out what the poet was trying to tell us? And then maybe later I'll come and go, okay, well, having heard that, I think, and then we can say, it doesn't matter what you think. And so poetry is difficult because, because it's poetic, and yet you're still going, man, in this rhyme and in this kind of illustration and in this, what do you, un- unlike the, the, the New Testament, I mean, Greek, Greek is like, it just, it tell, Greek is a little bit like English. It's to the point, it tells you like, this is what happened and then this is what happened and this is what this means. Hebrew, Hebrew is a lot like African languages. It's, it's all in picture. I asked, I asked my mom the other day, I, was, I, I said, uh, what, is, what is a window in Setswana? And, and I've almost forgotten. See, Setabiso, Sapefo. I said wrong. I'm exposing my mom here. Say, say, say it real quick. Setlava Pefo. There we go. Thanks, Tepo. Beautiful. I know most of us would have thought fence theory, right? Yeah, you were judging me. You were like, yeah, how does he not know? The fence theory. No, it's not. That's it's Afrikaans, guys. That's wrong. And, 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 and so in Setswana, that it's, it's, it's poetic because it's like, it's, it's, man, it's just the, the joy, the flow, the flow of that air, like to enjoy it. It's like you know, when they were making a window, they were like, we don't want a door. We want something that's, that's not as big as a door, but small enough so that we might enjoy the wind. Hebrew is a little bit like that. And so it makes it challenging when it's poetic because it's that, that added, added layer of trying to understand what's going on here. But I don't want to be a lazy theologian, and so... I still attacked the text as we should. And so from this poem that, that, that Deborah wrote and sang with Barak, the telling of what happened in Judges chapter 4, there's two main points that I, I believe God wants us to see. And that is, point number one, when the leaders lead and the people serve, everyone praises the Lord. When the leaders lead, and the people serve, everyone praises the Lord. We see this in verse 2 and verse 9. Verse 2 says, when the leaders lead in Israel, when the people volunteer, blessed be the Lord. Again in verse 9, my heart is with the leaders of Israel, with the volunteers of the people. Blessed be the Lord. Friends, when the leaders lead and the people serve, Everyone, everyone, everyone praises the Lord. Deborah mentions those who stepped up and fought. That's what she does in the song. She mentions those who stepped up and fought, and she honors them. She honors them in the song. However, the song also lists those who didn't show up. But I'll come back to that in a moment. When the leaders lead and the people serve, everyone praises the Lord. That that our mission, our mission is a community one. It's a community one. Men and women, young and old, all of God's gifts at work and on display. It is a community one. But but I want to pick on the men here for just a moment. Because we read in verse 3, Verse 15 and verse 19, she, she addresses the men. Look with me, verse 3, listen, kings, pay attention, princes. In verse 15, and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. In verse 19, kings came and fought. She addresses the men. See, when I, I, I read these passages, I, I recognize the, the role and the responsibility that God has placed on men and how so many of us men, we don't step up to those responsibilities. In fact, we can go all the way back to the garden in Genesis chapter 3. 
and, and we see the, the passivity of Adam. That there were, there were role and responsibilities given to him and, and he was just passive. And so men, I want you to hear this, that there is an evil of doing. I get that. There is an evil of doing and there is an evil of doing nothing. There is an evil of doing nothing. There are too many men in the church who fall into this category of doing nothing. And we hide behind statements like, sure, but I'm busy. That's why that's, I can't do it. I'm, I'm way too busy. How? How can you be too busy to pray? Too busy to make disciples? Too busy to serve? And the list goes on and on and on and on. There is a calling out of men who need to step up to the roles and responsibilities that God has placed on us. And, and the reason I call out men, because way too often, when men don't step up, we find women going, you know what, I'm going to do what God's called me to do, and I'm going to have to do what God has called you to do as well. Over and over and over again. And, and my hope, my hope, friends, is that at Rooted Fellowship, we might be like, hey, that's not us. Yeah. That's not us. We're going to step up. We want to be counted in the song. As those who showed up and fought, who were on mission. Now, look, guys, I'm not trying to, I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I know some of you are probably going, well, you're not, even, you're not even making me feel guilty, whatever. That's great. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Because the church doesn't need men of guilt. The church needs men of conviction. Men of conviction. Men who love Jesus and his word. Who, who open this up and just go, I'm, I'm, I'm so captivated by this. And where you're not, because I know there are tough days, where you're not to go, Holy Spirit, would you stir in my heart a passion for your name? Yeah. You know, I, guys, I know, I know, and we use these phrases all the time because they're really cool and super catchy. Um, I'm hungry for God. I get that. I get that. I know, you, you know, you can be hungry for God, but crave other things. It's a real thing. You know like when you're hungry and you know you should actually put good food in your body, but you, you're craving for chocolate. You know, you're, you're, you're craving for that thing that you know you shouldn't be eating. And so we should be on our knees saying, God, we're hungry for you, but, but, but we pray that our cravings would be for you. The church needs men who love Jesus and his word. The church needs men who love the church who love the church. The church is God's plan to reveal himself, to save people. Like, it's his plan. It says it in Ephesians. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God will be on display. And so I have no idea where we then got like, well, I don't know, I don't know. God, I think I've got another plan. I'm going to try something else. And I get it, I get it. Like many of us, if not all of us, we've been hurt by the church. So have I. And again, that's where we need to come to God and say, God, would you heal that which has been broken in me? Not to go, you know what, never again, I'm out. I'm going to go find another church. Well, that church was probably doing well until you showed up. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just being real. Because you show up with your, your brokenness and instead of stepping in and going, you know what, I need healing. I'm just going to sit for a bit. I'm not going to jump into things. I just, hey guys, I need help. This is what happened. You show up and go, let me pretend and perform. They don't need to know about this. Let me, you're just going to repeat the cycle. Men of conviction. Men who love Jesus and his word. Men who love the church and men who love the mission of God. The greatest adventure you'll ever be on. I know some of, some of y'all are hustling, you're grinding, building businesses and doing this and, and it's epic and I love it and I'm all for it. I want to be the wind in your sails but there is, I'm telling you, you will never find a better adventure than being on the mission of God. Yeah. 
It's one of those things that you're like, I'll never be able to fully accomplish, but it's, I'm seeing so many great things as I'm in pursuit of it. It's, it's one of the things that drew me to Christ. I'm sitting there as a university student just going, man, is this it? I mean, there's a little bit of arrogance there, right? And I'll be honest, I struggle a little bit with that. But I was like, is this it? Is it just about making money and then buying a big house? A house that has way more rooms than my heart has room for people to love, right? I could do that. I could get tons of those. What else? I'm going to go on holiday. I'm going to see the world. And then I, it's like, but is that it? There's got to be more. And God goes, there is. There is way more. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Amen. The church needs men who love the mission of God. See, friends, Satan's strategy is to keep us from that which God has called us to. It's to distract us. Yes, you're in his hand. You're a child of God. And once you're in God's hand, that's it. Nothing can take you. Nothing can remove you from God's hand. But you will be distracted by the shiny things that Satan places in front of you. That's his strategy, is to keep you distracted. When leaders lead and the people serve, everyone praises the Lord. But, but here's, here's in the song, people who didn't step up, Deborah mentions them. Which leads me to my second point, and that is, there are no spectators in the kingdom of God. No spectators in the kingdom of God. Uh, let me read to you the second part of verse 15 in Judges chapter 5. Deborah writes, There was great searching of heart among the clans of Reuben. Why did you sit among the sheep pens listening to the playing of pipes for the flocks? Now, look, there's nothing wrong with this, right? There's nothing wrong with playing pipes, hanging out with the sheep, nothing wrong with that. But, but, but here's the thing. There is a time for everything. There is a time for everything. And so word goes out and goes, hey, we've got to go fight. And they go, we've got to go What? Yeah, let me quickly go play some songs um, for the for the sheep. Like, why? There was great searching of heart among the clans of Reuben. Gilead remained beyond the Jordan. Dan, why did you linger at the ships? Why were you just chilling at the ships? Or, or maybe they made it, they made it to the harbor, right? Because we're told uh, Asher remained at the seashore and stayed by his harbor. So they made it to the harbor and then looked and they were like, sure. Yeah, maybe let's just chill here. Let's wait and see what happens. Because you know there is that group of people. We're just going we're gonna, to we're gonna wait and see. Let's go plant churches. Yeah, yeah. Let's just wait and see what happens. You know, like if it ends badly, then we'll be like, yeah, we told you. We, we told you that another way to do it. But if it ends well, it's like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. We were there. We were there, you know. They get named for their non-participation. She names them. Mm, there's no private and confidential here. But friends, it gets worse. It gets worse. Let's jump over to verse 23. Curse Meros, says the angel of the Lord. If you were here at part one, you'd remember that, that the angel of the Lord is a theophany. This is, this is God himself. So God here is saying, curse Meroz. Bitterly curse her inhabitants. For they did not come to help the Lord. To help the Lord with the warriors. The location of Meroz is unknown. I searched. But the reference to its inhabitants suggests it was a town rather than a clan. Given that it is mentioned immediately after the description of the root of Sisera's forces in verses 19 to 22, it may have been a town well situated to help Barak's men by cutting off the fugitives as they were on the run. If so, the fact that they did nothing was particularly inexcusable. They were strategically placed. 
for they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord with the warriors. It was not just God's people they failed, but God himself, to whom they owed covenant loyalty. Hence the appearance of the angel of the Lord, who brings the curse. Are you strategically placed? In your community? At your place of work? In your classroom? In your family? In your circle of friends? Are you strategically placed? I believe you are. Because God makes no mistakes. Go read Acts 17. He makes no mistakes. The fact that you are born in the, like you live in this time is, is God's doing. And, and, and this it should be so beautiful to hear because I, it doesn't matter how you showed up into the world because of God's redemptive plan for your life. You are supposed to be here. You are strategically placed. Rooted fellowship, are we strategically placed? It's, it's no mistake that we meet here at New Hope at a school like this, no mistake, we are strategically placed. We're strategically placed in the city of Pretoria. Not just to reach Pretoria, but I believe to reach beyond Pretoria. And, and so if that's the case, the question is, what are we doing? Are we chilling by the ships? Are we playing songs for the sheep? While the, the, the mission of God continues to advance. This is the darkest moment in the song and marks a very striking, very, very, very serious. I mean, there is an offense here. In some circumstances, doing nothing, being a spectator can be one of the worst sin. Just doing nothing. See, everyone had reason to praise God that day because of the the whole of Israel had been delivered. But not everyone could sing as Deborah and Barak did. Those who had failed to play their part probably stayed away from the celebrations. If they were there, they must have hung their heads in shame as their unfaithfulness was revealed. And even those who sang must have done so with mixed emotions. You know that feeling. It may not be here at Rooted Fellowship, but at some point you, you felt that. Where you, where you were like, I, sh- I should have been there, but I didn't. And now we're all celebrating and we're singing and it's epic and you're just going, I, but in all honesty, I, don't, I didn't contribute to this. I didn't give to this. I didn't serve. I didn't, sh- I didn't even show up. The victory at the river Kishon was a great deliverance, but it wasn't a perfect one. It was great, but it wasn't a perfect one. The foreign oppressor was gone, but Israel was far from well. Because we know there's more in Judges, God still had a lot of work to do. But it was enough for them to pause and celebrate, to be reminded of God's goodness. Friends, when leaders lead and people serve, we all praise God. And if that is true, that means that there are, there's no room for spectators in the kingdom of God. No room for spectators. So that means some of you need to get, get in the game. Get in the game. At the end of Judges chapter 4 and 5, if you were going on it, what's the big takeaway? I hear the two points, but, but, but what's the big takeaway? Well, here, here it is. Here's the big takeaway. And that is, all God requires of us is obedience. This is one of those repeating themes in the book of Judges. In fact, it's the repeating theme of the Bible that God requires obedience from us. If you're sitting and you're resting, you're like, what's my next step? Obedience. Be obedient. That's your next step. And it's obedience that is fueled by trust, by trusting in God, even in the face of danger. It's easy to be obedient when things are good. 
But, but, but when we smell danger, when we, when we realize that there's, there's, there's challenges and, 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 and difficulties ahead, we go, oh, but now it's like, God, did you really call me to make disciples? Did you really call me to give and to serve and to love? The answer is yes, God requires obedience all the time, even in the face of danger. And this is beautifully captured in the story of Jael. We see this in verse 24 to 27 as the story is unpacked in the form of a song. It was, not an, it was not a simple thing for Jael to do what she did. But the mere fact that she was a woman, that's number one. But, but the, the times in which they were living in, so, so one, she's going, I'm a woman, and I'm about to do something that I believe is right, and is going against my husband. I know he's got this, this secret deal with the king, but, but this is wrong. This is wrong. You know how many wives are having to step up because they, they watch their husbands go, Man, what, are you do, what are you doing? This was not particularly easy for her. And yet she chose obedience. Times were rough. Things were uncertain. This was a dangerous time. And, and, and we're told this, we see it in verse 6, where Deborah writes, in the days of Shamgar, a son of Anath, which is a super cool guy, I don't have time to unpack it. Judges chapter 3, verse 31, go read it. Men, if you're trying to figure out what it means to, like, what kind of man do I want to be? You want to be a Judges chapter 3, verse 31 man, right? A one verse man. Sham- Shamgar was this dude, like, he, he, he came up after Ehud. He's kind of between Deborah uh, and Ehud, and he shows up. Uh, he ends up killing 600 Philistines with an, an ox goat. An ox goat is like a farming tool. 600 Philistines with this farming tool. How do you do that? Oh, I'm sorry. How do you, how do, you do that? Let me ask you differently. How do you eat an elephant? One piece at a time. So, so how did Shamgar kill 600 Philistines with a farming tool? One at a time. What does that tell us? It's, it's about just being faithful and being consistent. Right? Whatever God has placed in your hand, just be faithful and consistent with it and watch him work. But again, that's not the passage uh, that I'm teaching. In the days of Jael, the main roads were deserted because travelers kept to the side roads. Villages were deserted. They were deserted in Israel. This, this was not an easy time. It was an unsafe time. And so, so you've got her being a woman, going against her husband, and the fact that like, this is it's just not safe. And yet she steps up to be obedient. There's something for us to learn here. It doesn't matter what you're facing. The call is to be obedient. And and, and your obedience is to the one who is seated on the throne, who fears nothing. Oh, now how do you know? Let's go back to the text. Verse 4. Lord, when you came to Seir, when you marched from the fields of Edom, the earth trembled. I know you're trembling, but no, when God shows up, the earth trembled trembles. The skies poured rain and the clouds poured water. The mountains melted before the Lord, even Sinai, before the Lord, the God of Israel. That's who we choose to be obedient to. We have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. The other big takeaway here, I'll close on this, is that God will one day make every wrong right. It's another repeated theme in the book of Judges. He he will make every wrong right. God will apply justice. They cried out to the Lord. They cried out to the Lord. Lord, Then God said, here's what you need to do. And they were obedient. And then God applies justice. In Judges chapter 4 and 5, we see that it's through a woman. Not Deborah. But a woman with a everyday house tool. She applies God's judgment. She crushed Sisera's head. She shattered and pierced his temple. God gets justice at the end. For every wrong you and I commit, it's important that you hear that. 
for every wrong that you and I commit. I think too many of us have a a Disney World kind of uh, fairy tale princess idea uh, of of how we are to read the scriptures. And so we, we never see ourselves as the oppressor, always as the oppressed. I could never be Egypt and Pharaoh. I'm the Israelites. Right? How we quickly run to being, oh, no, I'm David. Could never be Goliath. <laughs> Friends, you and I commit wrong. That there is no ethnicity, no culture, no race, no gender that has a monopoly on injustice. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't call out injustice when we see it. What I'm saying is that there's no culture, no ethnicity, no race, no gender that has a monopoly on injustice, that all of us fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And so God must apply justice. He must apply justice. And so it'll either be paid by Jesus, or on that judgment day, you will pay it. It's either paid by Jesus, like you, you, you receive Christ because God pours out his justice on him for every wrong that you and I have committed. And so you either have the opportunity of receiving Christ or on that final day, God will pour out his justice on you. But, but here's the difference between you and Jesus. Because you're not God, you will not get up again. That's the difference. You will not get up. Jesus rose from the tomb because he was without sin. You will not. And so Judges 4 and 5 gives us an opportunity to, to, to come before the Father and say, I receive the gift of Christ. You've poured out your wrath on him so that it doesn't have to be poured out on me. Because God will get his day in court. He will. And so I'm going to call up the band to close us out. I'm I'm going to to throw you out some Holy Spirit led. I'm going to throw you out some applications and and, and I'm going to start by saying this. The gospel, the gospel demands a response. You, you cannot hear these words and walk away going, mm. it demands a response. And so the question is, how will you respond? How will you respond? Maybe you've been on the fence for a while and you, you're going, I'm not 100% sure about all of this. I want you to hear this morning that God gives you the invitation of salvation. That through his son, Jesus, you have an opportunity to be reconciled back to the Father. And that all all the sin that you have committed, forgiven. Forgiven. But maybe you you have crossed the line of faith. You you do believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. but, But you've been hanging out at the ships. Just kind of watching not wanting to really get plugged in, not really sure, maybe this is not your thing, I'm a little bit too busy. The, the call is, is to be a part of the mission of God. He's inviting us to be a part of the greatest adventure that you'll ever be a part of. God's already on mission. right? This mission, this great commission is, is not something we came up with. God invites us to be a part of His mission. And so how will you respond? How will you respond? We're going to sing in a moment. And I said to you that, um, that when we sing, it is a proper natural response to what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. It's our deliverance. That God is mighty to save I want you to think about that for a moment. He is mighty to save, to pull you out out of whatever you are going through and to bring you into a life of fullness and joy, abundance, a life of meaning and satisfaction. You could not pull yourself out of that. 
And, and yet so many of us tend to think that we can if we just work a little harder, if we just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Well, the problem is you don't even have boots. And so how will you respond to a God who is mighty to save, a God who will get justice? And for those who are in Christ, you'll be able to look back and see the justice and go, okay, this is, this is how God is working in and through me. That whatever I went through, the injustice that I experienced, if I, if I didn't get uh, that which I went through, if I did, wasn't settled in this lifetime, it will definitely be settled in the next. And at that point, in all honesty, it won't even matter because you'll be with the Father throughout eternity, enjoying Him. That's the invitation. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it's living and active. That it pierces through soul and spirit, joints and marrow. That it judges our thoughts and our intentions. And so, God, in this moment, I'm asking, as we've just heard the word, I pray, Lord, that you would examine our hearts. In light of the passage, would you examine our hearts? Holy Spirit, would you draw us closer to you? Lord, I pray for those who have not crossed the line of faith yet. Lord, I pray that you would save them, that they would surrender their lives to you, a God who is mighty to save. And then God, I pray for those who've been walking with you for a while, be it three months or 30 years. Lord, I pray that we would sing to you who is seated on the throne, a God who is mighty to save. You have delivered us. You have rescued us. Would you sanctify us? Would you mold us and shape us to become more and more like your son, Jesus? God, you are mighty to save. Would you receive all the glory and all the praise? We're asking God that you would step into every aspect of our lives, our relationships, our finances, our emotions, our goals, our desires, God, you are mighty to save. God, would you send us out here with your truth and your power. You tell us that you prepare a table before us in the presence of our enemies. That we should fear nothing, Lord. But rather choose obedience over and over and over again. Holy Spirit, would you do that work in us? And that all of this, all of this would be a reminder that God, you are on your throne, a God who is mighty to save. And so as we sing this song, we also sing it together with those who've gone before us. Those who are right now in this moment are before the throne. We see them in the book of Revelation. They too sing this song, a God who is mighty to save. All glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.